Hey everybody, I'd like to thank you for your patience and for tuning into this final segment of my series on salt. In part two, I wondered about the cause of hypertension. If it's not caused by excess sodium in the diet, what is the cause? Well, I'm not gonna leave you in suspense any longer. Probably already you know the answer, but the answer is sugar. To be sure, sugar is related to many of our chronic disease processes. And it's not surprising, um, it's delicious and we love it, we just can't get enough of it. And that's why I am the Carb Addiction RD. Before I get back to my story, I want to remind you to take advantage of the discount code um, SALT ADDICTION at Redmond's. I encourage you to use that to get 15% off their products. In 1988, Gerald Reven presented his famous Bantine lecture where he described the metabolic syndrome, which he termed Syndrome X at the time, as a clustering of metabolic diseases which were all connected through insulin resistance, which he defined as elevated levels of insulin. Diagnostic criteria today for the metabolic syndrome vary slightly by organization, but typically include factors such as elevated systolic blood pressure, high BMI, um, increased waist size, elevated fasting blood glucose and triglycerides, and low HDL cholesterol. Some include low glomerular filtration rate, um, which is a measure of kidney function. Remember that your kidneys are where waste is filtered from the blood and where both sodium and water can be reabsorbed or sent out in the urine. So this is the Dietitian's Bible, Krauss's Principles. And this is what they have to say about hypertension. I'm paraphrasing here, but they say that the accumulation of visceral fat, that's the hard belly fat that we sometimes call a beer belly, um, this results in increased synthesis of the hormone angiotensin 1, which activates the RAS, which I talked about earlier in, in one of my earlier segments. And this causes elevated blood pressure. In this process, angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2, which promotes the development of large dysfunctional adipocytes. That's just fancy talk for fat cells. Um, these produce increased amounts of leptin and reduced quantities of adenopinectin. This activates the sympathetic nervous system, or the SNS, which is a key component of the hypertensive response. So I just read the definition of hypertension from Krauss's Bible book. Did you hear the, me say the word salt? Or sodium? Nowhere in that book do they mention the word sodium when they talk about hypertension in that paragraph. So, you know, we're all told when we're becoming dietitians that sugar is involved in these processes. And yet, as dietitians, we're told to tell our patients to reduce their sodium intake. This is crazy. All right, to be fair, Association is not causation, and it's still possible that excess sodium in the diet can be the cause of elevated blood pressure in the context of a generally poor diet. But we've already established that under healthy conditions, the kidneys will excrete any excess sodium. So what is it that's making those kidneys unable to do their job? Well, you know the answer, I already gave it away. It's glucose. So let's ha look at how glucose might be playing a role in this hypertension. When you eat food that contains sugar, it's readily broken down into fructose and glucose. These are both quickly absorbed into your bloodstream, but they are a little bit differently. So I'll talk about glucose first, and then we'll move on to fructose. Too much glucose in the bloodstream is toxic, both to blood vessels and to your body's tissues. Even mainstream websites like WebMD point the finger at hyperglycemia as a cause of atherosclerosis, which they say may lead to heart attacks, stroke, and kidney disease. However, under normal circumstances, this is not an issue as the pancreas will secrete insulin, which allows the glucose from the blood to enter the cells where it can be used immediately for energy or stored for later use. However, insulin is a hormone and it has many other physiological roles beyond moving glucose out of the blood. So that when a person develops insulin resistance and their circulating levels of insulin are much higher than in someone who is metabolically healthy, there are likely going to be some unintended consequences. 
So as we said before, insulin will cause inappropriate activation of the RAS, which increases blood pressure. Insulin also acts directly on the kidneys to cause retention of sodium and water. We observe the inverse when people suddenly um, stop consuming carbohydrates or if they go on a fast. The result here is natriuresis and diuresis, meaning that they will suddenly start pee literally peeing out sodium and excess water. And the result of this is often people will find that their blood pressure comes down and they lose that water weight, which of course is why you go on a low carb diet in the first place, right? So I want you to remember that image that I had in section two about the kidney. And remember now that too much glucose does damage to those microvessels. So elevated glucose levels are creating damage in those small vessels, impacting the ability of the kidneys to filter your blood. The high levels of insulin are causing too much sodium and water retention. So the problem would seem to be not that there's too much salt coming in, but rather that we can't get rid of it. So too much retained sodium will cause all kinds of problems for your blood volume and consequently your blood pressure. But this only seems to occur in the presence of insulin resistance. When doctors tell you that you have essential hypertension, what they're saying is you have hypertension, but I don't really know why. But the truth is, we know why, don't we? You have insulin resistance. The scary fact is that fewer than 12% of Americans are metabolically healthy, and many of those 88% don't even know that they have insulin resistance. If you've been diagnosed with hypertension, you likely fall into this group. Our kidneys are well adapted to get rid of excess sodium, but if you have insulin resistance, you can't get rid of it, and that's when bad things happen. But it's not the salt, is it? It's the sugar. So this is not new information. In fact, we knew about it back in 1985. In 1988, Ottavio Gianpietro proposed a mechanism for how diabetes causes hypertension. He suggested that diabetes is a state of sodium retention and decreased function of the sodium potassium pump. Now, if you remember, I talked about the sodium potassium pump in segment one of this series. So this pump works in all of your cells and it does an exchange of sodium and potassium. I won't go into all of the details, um, but insulin increases activity of this pump because you're trying to move solutes from the blood and into the cell. That's what one of the things insulin does. But in the case of hyperinsulinemia, the, the pump becomes insulin resistant and it no longer works as efficiently. And in fact, they have noticed that in obese patients with hypertension, that there is a lot more sodium stuck in their cells than in lean people. So one might really conclude then that hypertension is truly an insulin resistant state. Worse still, some studies have shown that low sodium levels may even itself be a contributing factor in the development of insulin resistance. Glucose, like sodium, is a hydrophilic molecule, meaning that it is both attracted to water and it dissolves in it. That means that after you consume a very high carbohydrate containing meal, the level of glucose in your blood will rise. Because glucose is attracted to water, water is attracted to glucose, that means that fluid or water will be drawn out of the extracellular fluid into the blood to be with the glucose. Now the glucose is absorbed into the cells, remember that's what insulin does, but it only takes the, the glucose, so it leaves behind all of that extra fluid in your blood. Now some of that will be excreted, remember that's what the kidneys do, but it requires some sodium. So if you have a high amount of glucose that was in the blood, a high amount of fluid, you may run into problems of having insufficient sodium to get rid of all the fluid, so excess fluid will remain in the blood and that is hypertension. Now at the same time, you're running low on sodium in order to get rid of all of that fluid volume. And like I said, there has been some connection to the development of insulin resistance from low sodium levels. I want you to think about the elderly in nursing homes for a moment. Even if they don't have hypertension when they go in, remember they're all put on low sodium diets because they're following the dietary guidelines in the kitchens of these places and they're also at the same time being fed ubiquitous carbs because that's cheap food. 
All right, so really these poor people in nursing homes, is it any wonder they all wind up on hypertension medications? So I've been talking a lot about glucose, but sugar or sucrose is comprised of both glucose and fructose. I remember back when I was um, a young child, my uncle was diagnosed with type two diabetes. His doctor told him to stop eating regular candy and switch to diabetic candy, which had only fructose rather than sucrose. Sounds great, right? It won't contribute to hyperglycemia or hyperinsulinemia, right? Well, because the kidney regulates the long-term control of blood pressure, any damage to the kidney will likely increase or perpetuate systemic hypertension. Now, I don't want to go into a lot of details about the mechanisms behind it of the fructose. Um, it's a little bit beyond the scope of what I wanted to cover here, but experimental evidence suggests that an acute effect of fructose consumption is to raise blood pressure through activation of the sympathetic nervous system, as well as oxidative stress and the formation of uric acid in the metabolism of fructose. These things cause damage to the endothelium of your blood vessels, all of those micro vessels get damaged, the endothelium of your intestines, um, so that's for the absorption of nutrients, and what happens is that they now are um, promoting more salt retention and volume overload, so more sodium is being retained, more water is being retained, and therefore that's raising the blood pressure. In 2021, Andrew Mente uh, wrote a persuasive argument for sodium to be considered as an essential nutrient, meaning that it is required for normal body function and health, and therefore it is expected to have a physiologic healthy range of intake, as do other essential nutrients. Most populations around the world consume between 3 and 6 grams of sodium per day, which, as I have said before, is significantly more than the dietary recommendations of below 2.3 grams per day. Current evidence from cohort studies suggests a J-shaped relationship between sodium intake and cardiovascular events, as would be expected for an essential nutrient. At the low end, you see more health is related issues and then there's that sweet spot that's the healthy range and then of course it's super physiologic range you might have some other um, issues so to date no study observational or randomized control trial has demonstrated a lower risk of cardiovascular events with low sodium in fact like i say it's sometimes observed to be somewhat higher and of course in that low intake of sodium is also where we see that association with insulin resistance so really folks the problem isn't that we're consuming too much sodium but you know that if you have insulin resistance you need to stop consuming glucose let me say that again. Salt is not the problem unless you have insulin resistance. Consume salt. One and a quarter teaspoons to two and a half teaspoons per day. Consume salt, but not glucose, not fructose. Thank you for watching.